con connecting myself, wiring for sound, and uh, as I do that, uh, I'm delighted to be here and to be sharing this program with two economics professors. It's a first for me, it's a, and it's also very comforting. It happens to be one subject that I never got near myself uh, in, uh, in, in my studies, and the work I'm doing now um, uh, makes their insights based upon the data bases and the analyses uh, invaluable. I think I've done this right now, John, yes? Connected. Um, my work is um, relying on the kinds of research that Barry has done and Joe has done, but the heart of my work is uh, about fomenting change, social change. And um, I brought some friends to, uh, with me to show you because they're involved in doing this as well. And I hope by the end of this evening, um, I'll have recruited some of you to want to be part of changing the future with me. We're convinced. Joe has shown us the evidence. It's indisputable. Uh, Americans are working longer, will be working longer. The trend line has shifted. Uh, we will have longer working lives. But that begs an important question, which is what kind of work is it that we're going to do. Um, there are two ways of looking at this period of longer work. And I'd like you to do a little bit of a mind twist with me for, for a moment. We, have, we are working longer because of the longevity revolution, which has increased the number of years that we're living. Uh, when the age of 65 was first named as the age for retirement by, believe it or not, Otto von Bismarck in 1876, when he was setting the age for collecting pensions from the Prussian army, he chose that date because he didn't expect anyone to live past it. He wasn't closely attentive to the fact that he was already older than that, so uh, there was a little gap in his understanding. But Essentially, uh, when the age of 65, the traditional age of retirement, was chosen, it was because it really wasn't expected that we'd be living much longer than that. Uh, when 65 was set as the first age for Social Security, it turned out that the very first person to collect her Social Security, she began a day after the year when Social Security went into effect, so she made one payment and then proceeded to collect Social Security for 35 years. So predictions of how many years one would be in this retired state um, have never been uh, applicable to all, um, but they were based upon certain assumptions. Uh, and what have we done? Have we added years of life to the age at which we are old? or elderly, or seniors, or retired? Are we reinventing re retirement? Are we seeing retirement as two stages, one of gradually entering um, a, a slowdown before one exits the workforce entirely? Yes, it is possible to look at what's happening now that way. But let me suggest a slightly different perspective. And that's that what we've done is add decades to adult life, not to old age. We've added decades to working life, not to retirement. And if we think about our longer lives as giving us a new stage of life, we have an opportunity for a new stage of work, not an edging down to gradually retire, but in fact, a distinct stage of work that's been enabled by a distinct and new stage of adulthood. It's not about a slow exit, but it's about what we will affirmatively be doing during this stage of life, how we will use it. And it was looking at the life trajectory that led my colleagues and I at Civic Ventures to try and give it a name 
um, and uh, uh, walk away from some of the awkward oxymorons like work and retirement and retirement jobs and begin to think about what's the highest and best use of this new stage of life and new stage of work. How can we maximize the value to be added to society by the experience we've developed as we've gone through our adult life and our um, midlife careers? And we came up with the term encore career uh, at, to name it. Uh, and the definition, which you see up there, is that it's work that combines personal meaning and social impact with continued income in the second half of life. I don't want to denigrate people who choose to continue their work in a bank or in sales, but in fact, I think you'll, I hope you'll all recognize with me that the highest and best use of this experience dividend the years in which experience can be put to work is to have that work be put to work for the common good, to become teachers and healthcare professionals and nonprofit workers. Uh, and the more we can encourage that, the more we will benefit as a society um, by this experience di dividend. So this idea of an encore career is a new term, but it's not a new invention. And I suspect that the um, bridgers that Joe studies in this longevity, uh, in this longevity data set um, are also reflected in the research that Civic Ventures did in 2008 uh, of people between the ages of 44 and 70, so they're younger than your data set, they were then, we chose those dates because it included the entire universe of baby boomers at the time and then a set of pre-boomers. Pre uh, and we asked them questions about what they were doing and what they expected to be doing as they, um, in, uh, as they thought forward to their work in the future, or if they were retired, what they were doing or what they wanted to do. Uh, we didn't use the language on core career because, in fact, it was introduced after the research had taken place, though we had uh, created it by the time this, this publication was, uh, was issued. Uh, it was first introduced in a book by the founder of Civic Ventures, Mark Friedman, called Encore. Uh, what we learned in the survey is that over half of adults between the ages of 44 and 70 are in or interested in an Encore career in fields such as education or health care, government, the nonprofit sector. And in fact, that includes a huge number that are already in on core careers. We found that between 6 and 9% of the national population are in what we would call an encore career based upon the definition I gave you. In real numbers, that means more than 5 million people. Uh, maybe these are some of the bridge job holders in, in your data set. Most of the people who are in encore careers in this study are the leading edge boomers between the ages of 51 and 60 at the time. Most come from professional and white collar jobs, have at least a college education, and tend to live in cities and suburbs. More are women, 56% of them. But it's not all elite or characterized by, that, uh, by those categories. Three out of 10 never graduated from college. Um, three in 10 live in small towns and rural areas. Two in 10 worked in blue collar jobs before making the switch to an encore career. Um, anyone in this audience think of themselves as in a new stage of work after their midlife career uh, in, a, in the social sector? Uh, and, uh, if you would uh, raise your hand if you know anybody as in an encore career. Okay, so there's a thing, even if you've never heard of the term, um, it describes something that already exists. What we found in our study was that in addition to the 6 to 9% already in on core careers, half of those who weren't found it an interesting idea. Um, why is it so appealing to turn your attention at some, at some point in your adult life to working for the common good? 
some elements of an encore career are desirable for the same reasons that all kinds of work after midlife are desirable. You need, you need extra income. You um, want to have a more flexible life, so the way you want to shape a job is different from the way you worked in your midlife. Uh, but what is unique about encore careers is that the work you're doing is to meet the needs of your community, is to have some type of social impact, is to work for the common good. And the reason there's a strong appeal for that has been um, noticed and studied um, in lots of different directions uh, and places. Eric Erickson, you may be familiar with his work writing about the concept of the generativity impulse. He explained that the hallmark of successful development can be encapsulated in the phrase, I am what survives me. Now, parenting is the most obvious example of that, but so is teaching, and so is mentoring, and so is coaching. A psychologist from the University of Massachusetts did a longitudinal study over three decades looking at adult development and found that participants who scored highest on self-fulfillment in their middle years and beyond were engaged in work that moved beyond the narrow personal concerns to concerns for others. Uh, and I quote from that study, the desire to leave a positive legacy is a fundamental motivation that in turn serves as a basis for self-fulfillment. What the longevity revolution has given us by extending our lives has made it possible not just to leave a legacy, but to live a legacy. And the idea of an encore career is to see this stage of your work life as that opportunity to live a legacy. Um, for the leading edge boomers who were uh, the most represented in the sample of people already in encore careers, and for um, older adults than those, um, there's another appeal. This is the, the universe of people who resonated with the words of a young charismatic president 50 years ago, because encore careers are, in fact, an opportunity to ask not what our country can do for us, but what we can do for our country. So let me give you a couple of examples of people in encore careers. I'd like to introduce you to Ed Speedling. He was an administrator in a, health, in a medical center. In that midlife career, he wore suits. He was ambitious. He was driven. He climbed the ladder, uh, advanced degrees. But the person who once described midlife as the time when you get to the top of the ladder and realize it's against the wrong wall <laughs> uh, must have known Ed, because that's what happened to him. Uh, in his own words, as the years wore on, I became increasingly aware of a yearning, at first vague but later unmistakable, to move to a place where I could work with people who, like a homeless woman who he had met at a subway station, lived on the edge of desperation. So in his late 50s, Ed decided to do something about this. He was lucky. He had the support of his family, um, and he left a 25-year career and then went through a very hard search to find someone who would believe that, in fact, he wanted to shed his suit and not climb further up a career ladder, but to do something like work with the, work with the homeless. And that is, in fact, what he ultimately got to do. He went to work for a homeless shelter. Um, and instead of being in management as a health care administrator, became an advocate and direct service provider. Wilson Good, name may be familiar to you even if the picture isn't. Uh, he was the mayor of Philadelphia for two terms. When he left his public office, he went to divinity school, became a minister, and then at the age of 62, he went to work for a nonprofit and started a program called Amachi to help children whose parents have, uh, have been incarcerated. He used his lifetime of contacts among churches and uh, in the political system to recruit volunteers to be mentors. And Amachi now exists in 48 states. There are 240 programs. Uh, Wilson Good likes to talk about how he went from success to significance. Uh, his transition was being a from being a public official to a social uh, intrapreneur. 
Some switch to encore careers after a life in the corporate sector and the business world. Arlene Carter was laid off from her job working in human resources for a real estate management firm. And she thought about, uh, as she was trying to figure out what, what to do next, she thought about what she'd like to do as a volunteer. A friend, suggest, uh, a friend suggested that she apply for a job with a, um, an organization, a foundation of a large senior community center that needed help in developing resources. Uh, and she went from being a human resources director to a nonprofit fundraiser. Uh, and is uh, in proudly in her encore career. Some people start new organizations. I don't mean the president, but the man he's shaking the hands of is Robert Chambers. And this is at an event at the White House where President Obama heralded the work of older adults who start new, new programs to meet our community problems. And Robert Chambers is a perfect example of that. He began his adult life in the military. He then had a career in the computer industry. And when he exited from that, he knew he wanted to work. He became a car salesman. While he was selling cars, he witnessed, his, witnessed things that troubled him greatly. He was stunned to discover how the business of selling cars worked when it came to the poorest, least sophisticated customers, uh, people his fellow salesmen referred to as woodchucks. Uh, he witnessed one man from the country who was convinced to buy a used car that was not likely to survive more than a year and to sign a high interest loan for five years. Not only was this car not going to survive the debt, but this man was depending upon this car to get him to his work. And as the customer drove away and Robert watched his fellow salesmen high five each other, celebrating the money that they made on the sale, Robert knew that this was not something to be proud of and this was a problem to be addressed. It spelled disaster for the country, for, for, excuse me, for the, uh, for the customer. And in fact, more and more of this can spell disaster for our country. Uh, Robert conceived of and created an organization he called Bonnie Clack. Uh, he loves click and clack and that's where it came from. Um, and what he does through Bonnie Clack is provide low interest loans and fuel efficient cars to the rural poor in New Hampshire and this is now spreading to other states. And what Robert says as he talks about his encore career is that he w I was old enough to understand the injustice I saw and experienced enough to do something about it. Not only for white collar people. This is uh, Brian Jones, who went from being a carpenter to a trades teacher in a vocational school. Uh, this is Nancy Voris, who was a long distance truck driver. Now she drives, uh, she drives uh, older adults, the sick and disabled, and children who mother, whose mothers are in welfare to work programs. She's still represented by the Teamsters, but she's dri driving for a different purpose. Uh, uh, this uh, is a slightly distorted picture of Michael McCormick, who, is, who retired as a pressman with the Cleveland Plain Dealer and now monitors the Cleveland Park District bike trails. Come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, and I could go on and give you many examples. Uh, you will probably, as I have talked about this and, and stretched your own memory banks, Thought of some, thought of others yourselves. You can go on Encore.org and read many, many stories. You can be attentive to what's being reported in the press. And now that you know the term Encore career, you'll recognize it when it's used. Um, but let me pause because not everybody in this room, although most of the people, if I'm eyeballing it right, are of an age to consider their own Encore career. Is this only about boomers and older adults? Is it an idea that's only for people in the second half of adulthood? We are the pioneers who are redefining the trajectory of life and the trajectory of work. And I will, I'm sorry to say to everybody who is at this front edge that it isn't easy, that to do it, you're finding your way through a system that's not really made to welcome you for a whole bunch of reasons. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But it really is about redefining the life trajectory 
not just for people who are ready for their encore careers, but people who are just beginning their, on, their careers, people who are in school, people who are looking ahead at the life that they will live. Um, imagine how different it would be if you thought about education as not something that only takes place until you're mid, in your mid-20s, but recognize that you could have opportunities throughout your adult life for more education, more career education, reskilling. Um, imagine how different it would be if you didn't feel you had to squeeze all of your work and career objectives into not only your 30s and your 40s and your 50s, but into the time when you're in your primary parenting years. You can see, as I'm just trying to suggest, I hope, that understanding that there's a new stage of work in the second half of adulthood can dramatically change how we look at education, how we look at our work lives in young adulthood as well. And um, if and as that happens, it's going to be a very different world for our children, our grandchildren, their children. Um, so no, it's not only about boomers. Uh, the work Barry mentioned briefly that we had him do for Civic Ventures was to take a look at whether there were jobs for people who were interested in for two years. Uh, and um, it was a project that basically connected the dots between projections of jobs that would be created, assuming our economy recovers, um, and the uh, labor force participation rates that Joe was describing. And even with the most optimistic picture of labor force participation rates changing uh, and people 55 and older working in far greater numbers than they do now, the, the study suggested that we would be seeing between 2 and 2.6 million unfilled new jobs unless people 55 and older worked even in greater numbers than are being projected by, by that data. And these are jobs in healthcare and social assistance, educational services, nonprofits, performing arts, what we try to capture as the nonprofit, as the nonprofit sector. Um, we went beyond that to take a look at jobs that could fit unmet needs but were not necessarily <coughs> captured by Bureau of Labor Statistics data. Uh, and um, two of the fields we looked at, um, one was healthcare, and uh, discovered that we could identify, and this is the tip of the iceberg, six emerging encore careers, work that would need unmet community needs that were a good match for the experience that people in the second half of life could bring to it. And you see listed on the screen six examples of that. We also looked at educate, work with, uh, in education and work with youth with the same lens what kind of jobs don't necessarily get captured by labor statistics today, but would meet unmet needs? We create, uh, and what let, that resulted in a listing, uh, again, of six jobs that would be good matches for people in encore careers. Some of these are people who um, have spent a lifetime as teachers in education, could shift how they're doing it to work in a new way. Um, and others are people who've never worked in to bring into working with and educating um, our young. For these jobs to be developed, for people who are seeking on core careers to find them, there are challenges. I wish I could say to you, and I'm sure there are some of you at least who will come up to me and say, okay, how do I do it? I want an encore career. I wish I could say to you, it's easy, do A, B, and C, but it's not. The challenge is including the need to change our culture um, and create a new social norm for what we do um, in the years between midlife and old age. Part of that new culture is to challenge ageism, skepticism that you could want a new stage of work that perhaps didn't have the status um, of the job you had in midlife, perhaps involves you, involves you in doing something entirely new that you're going to learn from the start. 
um, that's the type of skepticism that uh, Ed Speedling met up with as he tried to move into a new field. Um, we can all be change agents in advancing this idea of creating a new social norm by talking about Encore careers. Uh, I will tell you, I am in an Encore career. I could describe my work, I could describe how it's different from what I did before, but by identifying what I'm doing as an Encore career, I'm hopefully encouraging others to say, well, what is that? Um, and learn about it, and that's a term that will come more, become more and more common and more and more part of the fabric of our society. We also have to develop Encore opportunities. Um, not in today's economy. We've got a job crisis. Um, it's the hardest time to do it. But in fact, there are uh, organizations that are valuing and looking at Encore career seekers. Um, uh, in 2009, uh, Civic Ventures gave Encore Opportunity Awards to a variety of organizations that were engaging, were valuing people interested in Encore careers, and um, this is a, a, the, the sample of them. Uh, and as I have conversations with employers all over this country, uh, I find myself often starting with, well, what are your needs, and engaging in a conversation about the value of recruiting from the pool of experienced talent that they may not think of because it's a different pool and requires a different recruitment, uh, recruitment approach. Um, beyond developing Encore opportunities, beyond changing the culture, we can and will need to change our policies and create pathways so that transitions don't have to be a do-it-yourself venture. Um, the on the policy front, Joe described how shifts in Social Security created incentives remove disincentives to work, and in fact, creative incentives to working longer? What if we looked at specific incentives to working longer for the common good? Uh, uh, the idea of loan forgiveness, um, if you move from college into uh, medical school into teaching in underserved areas, um, what if we were to look at shifts in the social security system so that if you continue to work after 65 and do it as a teacher, the amount you contribute back into the social security system is different than if you continue to work. In it's not beyond our imagination to figure out ways to create incentives to pull people into social purpose work. And a uh, quick word about the idea of pathways. Um, then represents the work one does in midlife and now the Encore career. It was a way we created to make this visual. But probably the most important piece of this is the semicolon. Mary Catherine Bateson once said the problem with adulthood is that it goes on too long without punctuation. We <laughs> added a punctuation. It used to be a period. Um, and frankly, the idea of a bridge job is not very different from looking at that as a period, because the now is a pathway to retirement. Um, during that semicolon um, is the opportunity to figure out what you want to do next and um, to explore it and to move into it. Uh, and that's where help is needed because we're not well set up to help people make that transition from then to now, how to navigate the semicolon. Community organizations can do that. I wish I could say that uh, Massachusetts is ahead of all states in, in creating and developing programs to help. We do have one. It's a leading program and a leading example. It's discovering what's next. It's founder or co-founder, Carol Greenfield, is in the audience today. It's based in Newton, and um, in November, Discovering What's Next held it, uh, an Encore Career Summit, which was aimed at giving some practical advice to people who are seeking Encore careers. Uh, experiential pathways. Volunteering 
is a good way to find an encore career, but we also could be creating um, programs such as encore fellows. They exist in California. They're being created in Portland and in New York. We could bring that to Massachusetts. Um, other experiential pathways would be uh, service through, uh, through things like AmeriCorps. The Serve America Act, one of the last uh, accomplishments of uh, our, our Senator Kennedy, um, created uh, uh, the concept of encore service and set as a goal that 10% of all AmeriCorps positions be dedicated to people who are 55 and older. Um, there are programs and examples around the country of ways to help people through experience move into encore careers. Uh, and then there are educational pathways. Community colleges are offering courses. They're developing them to fit, to meet um, workforce needs, higher education uh, here at Harvard across the river. Um, is a very elite version of this. It's called the Advanced Leadership Institute. It takes high-level CEOs and helps them figure out their business plan for what they will do in their encore career. Um, so lots of examples and lots of opportunities. Um, I can't offer you a job or a clear place to go, but I can make you aware of uh, looking for an encore career, which is a guide that could help you get started. Um, you could find it on the Encore.org website, uh, and um, it is a beginning, and I can invite you to help us make this a social norm in creating the types of changes that will make it easier for people to move into Encore careers when they, when they decide that that's what they want to do. Uh, introduction to these two topics is over. I think it's time for a break. Yes. And back in five. Back in five.